Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Martin Rzeźnicki. Uh, I work for uh, Iterators. Uh, in case you haven't heard of us, we're a Scala consultancy company based in Warsaw. So uh, you could check us out if you feel like it. And um, having said that, uh, today I'm going to give a talk about Idris for Scala developers. Uh, you might be asking yourselves, why these two? Why do we compare Idris with Scala? For one thing, Idris is known for its dependent types. Um, but what that actually is, and what's the advantage of having this in your type system, uh, what expressiveness or expressivity do you gain with, uh, with dependent typing, that I will try to explain a bit as well. So uh, to kick it off, there is this quote I very strongly agree with. It's been attributed to a lot of people throughout the years, but uh, its actual author was uh, Kurt Lewin, who was an American psychologist, who in the 40s coined this, this slogan, that there is nothing more practical than a good theory. And well, theory will help us, we'll start with it uh, a bit, and it will help us to see what the possibilities are. What can we expect of uh, type systems? And possibly where on the scale of you know, type, type system power, expressiveness, where the type systems that we are used to are. Um, so you can see possibly what the benefits of dependent typing for a contemporary programmer are. Because it's not always the case. It's rarely the case that we want the most expressive type system. Well, for one thing, with gain of expressiveness, you often lose some guarantees. Uh, for example, type inference might not work, or um, type checking times might be unbounded. So uh, the question is, what is the point of impracticality on this scale of expressiveness? There are Two tools, well, there are many tools, but uh, I want to talk about two tools uh, that can help us exploring this, this theoretical landscape. One is a, a visual representation, it's called Lambda Cube, and the other is a, a mathematical framework or theory called pure, or sometimes generalized pure type systems or generalized type systems. And that's a mathematical well, theory for describing and deriving type system families. Um, so Lambda Cube is well, a cube, a drawing of a cube. Uh, and the idea here is that if you travel different, in this cube in, or traverse the cube in different directions, you get different abstractions that you mix together to create uh, type systems. And what these abstractions are, well, uh, Informally speaking, it's, it's about dependencies. What dependencies between things that type system might operate on, like terms and types, what dependencies are allowed? We have four of them. And to give you a feeling of what that is, maybe I'll show some snippets of code. So uh, when term depends on term, and by term we mean constant, a variable, a function, application, a function, and so on, you'll get just this, a simple, the simplest things possible. The examples are in Scala, in, in Idris. Uh, so you can possibly have high order functions and think, things like this, but you don't have any kind of uh, polymorph computation and so on. This you get when you allow a term to depend on type. When term depends on type, you can write things like identity function term, uh, which depends on type and can be used in any context for any type, for any A or a function which uh, takes other function and applies it twice to argument, that kind of stuff. Basically parametric polymorphism. When a type can depend on type, what you get is a type constructors, possibly higher order types. Uh, the venerable list type or uh, I know functor, these are types that do depend on other types. And when the type can depend on term, that's where it gets interesting. That's actually the subject of this talk in disguise. That's dependent typing. For instance, uh, in Idris, the, the lower example is you have a vector of, which is a type constructor, which takes a type. You have vector of A's, 
but it also takes a natural number. So you have vector of five of a's, vector of six of a's. The intent here is that uh, this natural number expresses the length. But this type depends ultimately on a term, which is a natural number in this case. Well, in Scala, you can, you can do the same thing. Maybe that's a bit obscure for, for you, but it's possible. So uh, if you look at the upper example, you have a function uh, who, which uh, return type, which result type, depends on its arguments. So that's a type depending on term, on term that in this example. So in Scala, it's also possible. So the idea is that if you travel up or upward, then you add term to type dependency when you travel right ways, to, then you add uh, type to term dependency when you go to the back to the cube, you add type to type dependency. So that's uh, how lambda cube describes families of types. Well, uh, I think I will, because time is pressing, I think I will skip the mathematical stuff. The slides are online, so you can check it out if you're interested. So uh, I guess we'll skip the, the pure type systems theory. What's important here is that all corners of lambda cube can be represented using this theory and much more. For example, lambda cube can, and that's the point in case where you don't want the most expressive systems possible. For example, the pure type systems theory can represent so-called system U. That's a system where all types are inhabited, are inhabited. Uh, well, why, why that's wrong? Because uh, if you think about Curry Howard isomorphism or Curry Howard correspondence, uh, in this inter under this interpretation, uh, proving a theorem is equivalent to a program, to a computer program. Yeah, under this imp interpretation, types are propositions and computations that create an instance of type are proofs that this proposition holds. This computation can take arguments and they are treated as hypothesis of this theorem. Then, if we think about this this way, then when all types are inhabited, what you get is that anything is provable. And if anything is provable, then, lo then reasoning in the system is meaningless. It's logically inconsistent. For instance, types of functions from A to B for any A to B. That's an example of an uninhabited type, type that shouldn't be inhabited. Why? Because under curry howard isomorphism, that represents a theorem when you know something, you'll know anything else. And equivalently, if you are tasked with writing a function from A to B for any A to B, you won't be able to do this, because if you take argument of type A, and you'll have to create some unrelated type B, then how would you implement it? It's not possible. Well, in system U, it's possible, but that, that's very expressive type systems, but it's meaningless. It's not really usable. But corners of lambda cube, I'll show you some examples of what type systems are there. So uh, that I'm going to skip. Uh, but um, in the, the simplest system, in the bottom left corner of the cube, that's where we start, is the type lambda calculi. And that's a system where you can, well, computational-wise, it's equivalent, anything can be computed there. It's equivalent to a lambda calculi and, or a Turing machine. Any computable function can be computed there. But type-wise, you, you can only have simple types and one type constructor, which is a function type. So this is not very practical type system because there are no real types, so to say, and there is no polymorphism whatsoever. We need something more. We need to at least have ability to create types, more elaborate types. So we go to the back of the cube. Uh, and there we obtain system. We had type to type dependency, and we obtain somewhat strange system, which is called lambda omega. That's a system where you can derive very elaborate types, like either list and, well, anything, but there is no term-level polymorphism, so you can't use them in a function. So you can have whatever you want in types, but you, do, you won't use them at the function level. 
So you can have a function in this type system, which makes it strange, which creates length of any list, even though any list is representable in this type system. You can just have a function that obtains length of list of ints and so on, so on. So that's not really practical. We need to be able to mix type to type and term to term dependencies so we need to go upward the cube, where we have two somewhat famous types, uh, famous type systems, system F. Well, system F is, uh, can be considered famous because Hindley Milner type system, you probably all heard of, is a subset of this, uh, of this type system. And ultimately, you get system F omega, which sometimes is called higher order polymorphic type lambda calculus. That's the that's where you get everything you're used to in, and when you think about type systems and much more. You can unleash the whole power of lambda calculi at the type level. The type computations can be arbitrarily complex. So it's very powerful and very expressive type system. It's so powerful that languages actually do deliver slightly less than this type system. Well, for instance, type inference is undecidable in this type system. Also, if you think about it, uh, when you have full lambda calculi at the type level, then you can represent unbounded recursion. So type checking might never finish, might never terminate. So our day-to-day -day languages like Scala and Haskell, they typically do not deliver the full power of the system. They deliver slightly less. For instance, there is a thing called higher rank polymorphism, which cannot be represented in Scala, all this directly. Uh, to give you a feeling of, uh, of the problem, well, let's say you have a function from A to a tuple of A's. This function effectively doubles its argument and works for any type A, so uh, we could think that it can be used in any context. There are no constraints in the type whatsoever. But if we want to use this function like in, um, like in this example, so we want to feed it with some argument of type B, and while well, we hope we get a tuple of Bs in return, that should work, but it won't actually compile. I'm not sure if that's visible, but it won't compile in Scala. Scala will complain that, well, there is a type A, which it wants, and you give it type B. Uh, so why is that? Because uh, Scala insists on having these type arguments to be well, quantified at the, late, at the earliest possible moment, at the beginning of the function, it needs to set these types. So in a fictional scala like here, we would like it to be, we like this function to have just one generic argument, one generic type parameter B, and type A should be like on this, only on this function level. So that's how would you probably would have written that in fictional scala, but it's not possible in scala, but it's impossible in system F and in system F omega. It's not possible in Scala, so Scala does not deliver the full power of this type system. Well, it's possible in Erie's flow. You can restrict type A to be, well, uh, just informally speaking, at the level of, of this function. So it's possible in Erie's, but it is, in Erie's, there are not higher rank polymorphism, like free polymorphism rank free is not expressible as well. Um, well, there are other examples. You can prove something like on the type level, in system F omega and in Scala and in Idris that A and B implies A, for example. So here's the, here's the code. Um, I just said that we have so expressible, so powerful type system that common languages cannot take advantage of, so to say. But still, there are some deceivingly simple things that we cannot express even given this very powerful type system. Like, well, collections, what I mentioned earlier, collections of known length. Well, that's, that looks practical, right? We probably don't want to take seventh element of sixth element collections, but it's, you cannot represent it in any of the type systems I mentioned, even uh, given their, uh, their powerfulness. Type of dates where range of day, for example, is restricted to month. That's a fact of life. That's something which we probably should be able to express. 
Uh, functions like sprint, that's interesting. Well, a sprint at some level can be seen as function from string to string, but uh, we all know that it's not really the case because the string argument to a sprint function, for a format string, if you will, gives, has some internal structure that determines what sprint will operate on. So it's not really a function from string to string, it's a function dependent on the string argument of something. And we can represent it, and there are other cases as well. So, um, question. Whether this additional type safety that looks really practical, the examples I mentioned, I think you all, you all would agree that they seem practical. Whether this should be added, can we simulate it somehow in languages that do not intrinsically support it, like Scala? And is there any gain? Is it, well, possible? So, when I was researching this, I came across a Stack Overflow discussion, and uh, there's this quote from my taken from this discussion where he mentioned that, uh, you know, the combination of single types, power dependent types, and implicit values, and so forth, so forth, means that Scala has surprising good support for dependent typing. Well, if that's something that Miles Sabin mentions, then it's at least, at the very least, worth considering. So, is it possible to have this in Scala, and what effect on, you know, our programming habits will that have? So, let's, uh, let's go from the theory to some practical examples. Well, I'm not sure, is it visible in code? Because it's going to be important. Well, I take it is. Um, so the convention here is, I will try to show you some examples of dependent typing as found in Idris that are going to be on the left. And on the right, I will show you the possible implementations of these ideas in, in, in Scala. Well, the simplest dependent type is, what did I just do? What should I press? Press it again. OK, I did that. Now, the simplest dependent type is this vehicle type here. Uh, it's dependent on a dependency, meaning only few values. It's technically value dependent type. It describes a vehicle which is dependent on power, so it can be you know, petrol, pedal, or electric, and some uh, instances of this type, like bicycle, and so on and so on. Additionally, you have a review operation that's restricted only to uh, petrol powered vehicles. So this is technically dependent type, but it's, uh, you know, it's a thing where Scala object-orientedness, I guess, really shines, and where Idris needs to catch up. Because these kind of dependencies, I would say they are the object-oriented programming essence, and Scala is, in some part, object-oriented language. So we have many ways to encode this, and the expressiveness in Scala is actually better. Let me show you how. For example, we can encode this dependency as a subtype, so we can create a subtype of vehicle as a petrol, electric, bay, and so on and so on, and then restrictions of refuel operations are apparent to, or obvious to implement. Uh, all right, uh, but there is one problem, and this problem is also, uh, is also, does also exist in, in Idris implementation, it's that we cannot easily represent things like hybrid cars, which have, well, two power sources, well, petrol or, and electric. To do that in Idris, we would have to do something fairly advanced, like, um, I don't know, a type classes is found in Haskell. But in Scala, it's, I know, very easy to achieve. We, we just can just encode this dependency as mixings, as traits, and mix them in, in concrete implementations. Then, uh, you know, isolation of refuel operation is, e is just as easy. Uh, in addition, we gain ability to express something that's not really express, that's not easily expressible in Idris, meaning uh, hybrid cars with many power sources. But there are other options. Uh, you can use uh, phantom type. Uh, the name comes from the fact that this type is only used, you know, during type checking. It's not ever used uh, in implementation. Uh, it doesn't have any representation. It just, uh, you know, parameterizes base type to give it some additional trait for type checking. So we can encode power source as a phantom type. We can have uh, then vehicles of many 
uh, uh, power sources as easy as possible and we can still write refuel operation uh, even more akin to how it's written in Idris and uh, well, uh, these being sealed traits make it work really well because uh, Scala you know, completeness check of, of pattern match is going to work in this case. Mm, so this is where Scala wins, I would say, but this is a very simple example. Let's move to some more, uh, more sophisticated ones. For instance, an interest is famous for representing uh, natural numbers on type level. Well, it's not really how... Uh, there is no difference in interest between value world and type world. Both can be mixed. There is no difference between them. So, for example, a natural number is implemented here. It's a recursive type. can be used on something we would call type level, like here, to have a vector, vector's head operation being restricted to non-empty vectors only. Well, uh, let's try to simulate. This is recursive type, uh, which consists of fairly standard encoding called church encoding of natural numbers. It can, natural numbers are either zero, is either zero or successor of some other number. We can encode this in SCAL. We just need a trait, uh, a type member carrying representation of this, and the recursive case is going to be represented as, uh, as type parameters to, uh, to our type constructors. And using this representation, which is translatable easily, we can create singleton types. I mean, by singleton types, I mean types which have only one member possible, like type of 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, so on, with values of these structures. There's only one structure that can carry uh, this type. So, well, we just, these types represent on type level uh, numbers, natural numbers. But then in Idris, we have a well, uh, they are interchangeable with literal. So Idris understands that, for example, 2 is a successor of successor 0, and you can assign something like number 500 to a natural number. Is this possible? Well, uh, it's not really possible. You can do some tricks. Well, for example, you can use macros to generate the structure out of integer or literal for you. The implementation there would just take a number which would have to be constant because at compile time it would have to apply type constructor as, as many times as needed and to deconstruct it, it would do the, other, the opposite way. But obviously it will have to be at compile time constant because had that, be, uh, had that been a variable then we wouldn't have been able to apply, we wouldn't know how many times to apply this. Well, then how would you write a function which takes an input from user and creates this natural number? Where you could, you know, uh, be smart and write it simply in a recursive way to create this representation. But, uh, well, there are some problems with this approach. First of all, and this slide is going to be very important later on. First of all, there will be no type preservation. What that means, we just return a natural number here. We lose our singleton type. Compiler just knows there is some nat with some n inside, but it doesn't know the structure. And then we don't really gain anything because we can't use, uh, we can pattern match on type level anyway in Scala, right? So even though we would be technically able to create a natural number with this structure from any integer number even, a variable, then we wouldn't be able to use it in any possible way. So let's just restrict ourselves to illiterals for, for now, okay? So we added natural numbers at type level. Let's cr try to simulate something more complicated, a fin, which means finitely bounded numbers. So fin n is a type that represents fin6, for example, a range of numbers from, a number restricted to range maybe from zero to five. And its uh, constructors are either zero or successor, but this successor is limited in how many times it can be applied. 
So for example, you can take four, fifth number out of six numbers, but not seven number out of, seven num out of six numbers. So that's, finite, that's isomorphic to finitely bounded natural number. Can we encode this in Scala? It's type indexed by integer, it's recursive as well. Well, yes, we can use the same technique. We just take everything that this type depends on. First, we notice that there is no representation for zero, right? So range from zero to minus one is not correctly representable. So we can encode this in constraints in Scala. Uh, everything that this depends on, this, this recursion type level depends on, we encode as type parameters with appropriate bounds. And using this, the almost algorithmic technique we represent, we can represent it in Scala very easily. But then how could we create any computation? For example, how can we convert this, this finitely bounded number to a natural number on type level? Well, it's, it's possible as well. So if you take function like this, like fin to nat, meaning finitely bounded number to natural, you just, and you try to recreate a type level, you just need to lift this computation to a type. Well, just creating a type that represents this computation, say trait. You encode everything that's input of this function as a type parameter. You encode the result type as type member in Scala. And thus, you lift a computation to a type. Then you create a type uh, that's capturing the result. It's sometimes known as aux pattern, if you are familiar with, uh, with Scala type level wizardry, but I, yeah, I prefer the name result because that's what it really is, the type that describes that result of fin to nut for a fin f is a natural number n. So that's a type of result. So in this way, we'll lift that computation to a type. But then uh, how would we make it do anything? compute anything. Well, there's only one thing in Scala that's possible to, uh, that you can customize during compilation. Because, well, there are computations that compiler does during type checking, during compilation, like type unification, but this is set in stone. You cannot change it. But there is one thing you can steer, that's implicit resolution. So, that's the only way to make, it, make a compiler compute something for us, to find the exact types we need. So these cases we encode as implicit search. We have a base case, meaning for fz0, so well, we just create an implicit with correct result. So result for a zero is type level zero. We already know how to instantiate this implicit, so this is our base case. And in the recursive case, we do the same thing. So we say, if you are able to find a result for some finitely bounded number f, which is going to be so far and will be a natural number, a type level natural, so to say, then I'm able to create a result for successor of this. And yes, I am able, I'm proving it like here, I'm just taking successor, a type level successor, of this representation here, so I'm able to, uh, to encode this computation fully. Then just, you know, a few tricks and you're done. So you have a result fin to nut for something is uh, S of Z, for example, type. So we just created a computation that happens exactly at type level. And is a direct translation of Idris code. What's more, we use a dependent type in Scala here to preserve structure representation. That's the most important thing here. You can't just make it return type like not. Because not doesn't mean anything to compiler. It doesn't know what structure it has. It needs to know the exact structure. So we return a captured out type, which, uh, as I told you before, we encode result in. And in this way, we can have a very precise representation. All the structure is preserved. So all the implicits, all the further computations can work on this structure, can deconstruct it. Okie dokie, even more complicated functions. Uh, how many time do I have? How much time do I have? 10 minutes, all right. Uh, even more, uh, you know, come on. 15 minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
Huh? Oh, so it was me. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, even more, uh, you know, something that would look like complicated computation, more complicated functions, you can create using exactly this technique, almost algorithmically. Input as parameters, output as arguments, and so on, so on. Result type encoding, and so on, so on. You can uh, create fairly complex computations on type level this way. Now, uh, this technique works. You encode computation in implicit search. What's we can even do better than Idris, what's the what's most interesting thing maybe here. So where Idris has a maybe of finitely bounded number, because it doesn't know if arguments are correct, we don't have to preserve that, because the nature of implicit search is such that if the implicit is not found, so the conversion cannot be computed, cannot be made, then simply the program won't compile, so we don't need to represent failing computation by option, or maybe, because we are sure that if argument then uh, it will be a compilation error. So as a corollary, if the computation succeeded, then program is compiled. So we can do better than it is in some cases. All right, so with this, we are ready to recreate a poster child of dependent typing, meaning a vector of, uh, which captures uh, length as a type, Using the same techniques, even with some you know, added tricks like uh, covariance here, uh, we can create vectors that track their length in Scala. And there will be a problem. Sometimes you need to be a little bit creative with this translation, because where, where Idris says that tail and head are available only for non-empty vectors, then, well, yes, but how do we know, for example, the type of a tail? of this vector. We can take successor of something, but we cannot take easily predecessor, so we don't know the type of the tail. And we can't really pattern match on generic data types in Scala, so how would we implement, uh, you know, head, for instance? We cannot pattern match. So sometimes we need to get a little more creative, I would say. Um, so we create something like type level predicate, type level pattern match called iscons, that, and the intent here is that we create, we, we you know, enhance it in such a way that it's able to deconstruct or in Scala parlance and apply for us. So take out the elements we need uh, and captures the types we need. So we call it iscons because it's really implementable for, and we encode all the constraints and so we implement it as, as an implicit search and so on, so on. And then using it Using this implicit evidence, we can create head and tail, and it's going to work exactly as in Idris. So in Idris, when you create a vector of two elements and try to take head of it or head of its tail, then it's going to work. But if you want to, to you know, recurse too deep, then you'll get a nice error that there is a type mismatch between zero and successor. Well, in Scala, you can do the same thing. You can create a vector of two elements, and you cannot you know, go too deep in this into this vector. Well, error messages are maybe worse, but they are customizable anyway, so, so we can do the same thing, almost. Because, well, you might feel, you might, uh, feel as, as, as I'm cheating a bit, because we'll probably notice that in all these examples, length of a collection was statically known. And then what, how can I represent collections with unknown length? That's a bit of a problem. Because if length becomes part of type, and length is unknown because collection comes from you know, database, then what then? Type is, cannot be fully represented. And in dependent typing theory, there is a way to do this. It's called sigma type. But better name is dependent pair. So dependent pair is a type that takes something as its first argument and something that depends on it as second argument. Uh, I did it again. One more minute for this. Uh, so for example, type of filter is not a vector of filter operation that you know, filters vector. It's a dependent pair which takes a number which is length of collection after filtering and a vector of according type. 
So for instance, if you take a filter of one, two, three uh, list with a predicate is even in Idris, it's not that Idris type tracker magically knows that the answer is one or vector of one element. It just uses different type to represent vector of unknown length. And it won't allow you to do anything with it, meaning type checker, unless you turn off the screen. Uh, unless, oh, all right, unless you pattern match on the first element. And if you pattern match the first, if you deconstruct the first element, then nature of this type is that the type of the second element will follow accordingly. And that's one thing that Idris has and Scala doesn't have. So for instance, if, oh, come on. If you assert here that the first element is number three, then you know that the type, and type checker knows, more importantly, that type of the second element is vector of three elements. And if you know it's at least one, then it's vector of at least one element. So it's, these are operations are deemed safe. But if you try to cheat, then it will tell you type mismatch between k and sln. So this is the way to represent and operate on something of unknown length, even though length is part of type. Can we do that in Scala, where we can represent sigma type in Scala? Maybe a bit awkwardly, but it's representable. You, you probably don't see, um, don't see the dependency here at the first glance, but it's hidden here. You just demand implicit that you know, follows the type. So, well, just, let's just take a look at an example. I don't have much time for this, so maybe let's take a look at this example. Uh, so, for example, dependent vectors you can create like this. You can say that there is an implicit that, ca that carries a number, a type level number, and vector of according number of elements. It looks good. So, for example, if you create a, a singleton 2, then the only thing you'll be able to have as a second argument will be a vector of exactly two elements. So, not, uh, for example, if you try to put there a vector of three elements, it won't compile. So theoretically, you are able to, to represent this case in Scala. It has everything you need. Unfortunately, we go back to this slide. Once the number is not constant, there is no type preservation. Meaning, using some reflection wizardry in Scala, if you lose the singleton type, this one. So compiler knows that two has a, as a representation, a success, is, is as a representation a successor of one, of type level one. But once you lose this type, one, for example, it doesn't take much to lose it. For example, you just assign it to a generically typed variable, then the compiler doesn't know anything here, right? It just know that there is some type n that's in a representation and none of the implicits, none of the computations that I showed before will work. So that's the bridge you can't cross. So it's not really practical to simulate collections in Scala, dependently typed collections in Scala, because you'll be able to only represent collections of, known, of statically known length, which is not a common use case of, for, for, the coll for collections. And all the uh, things like filter that do not preserve size, you, want, you, you have to give up on them. So this is not really practical to have this type. At the type system level, it's going to work. But once you get out of this singleton type preserved structure, you won't have anything. But there are cases where it's practical, the famous sprint, for instance. Well, it's as value dependent thing as you will see in your life. So print in Idris takes a string, parses it into a structure, and from this structure, it creates a final type. So for instance, a type for a function print uh, person and so on, it's string to int to string. In any other case, it's string to double to string. Value is seamlessly lifted into type. It's as value dependent thing as you'll see in your life. It even parses the dem string to create you know, a final type, which is deduced from the structure of the string. Well, um, this is the bridge you can cross, as you said. As I said, right? You cannot just take, go from string to a 
function type or print function type in Scala because of this. So you'll be limited to possibly macro, which you will use to parse the string into the structure. But it's still practical because format string in print, you can treat as effectively constant, as a string literal, without, you know, without crying, right? And everything else you can recreate in Scala. And the final result is that the type, print type of this structure is string to into string and of this structure is string to double to string. You can do, you can do it in Scala as well. So, sprint looks practical because it's, what we are dependent on is effect, can be made effectively constant without loss of functionality. So that's my final thesis. Uh, you can do it in Scala. The type system of regions in Scala aren't that different. You can express almost everything, roughly everything that you can in one, in another, in the other. Uh, but there are cases which you can't express, uh, which are effectively, which deal with you know, real variables, things that we do not know. But there are cases where, which are more constant-based cases, like state machines, which are effectively constant uh, at compilation, or print flag cases, or rules, protocols, which are effectively constant, then without loss of functionality, we can have dependent typing as shown in Scala. And I guess that's the end of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's have five minutes of questions. Five minutes of questions, thank you very much. Yes. Um, so why can't these bridges be caused uh, in Scala? So why is, uh, does the Scala compiler or so have the same support as Idris. Why don't, why, is there a can of worms also in it or so? Why, why it's not built in? Uh, if I understand your question correctly, I'm not sure if I do, but uh, the question was, uh, is, can, Scala, can Scala compiler support everything that Idris compiler could? So it's mm -hmm. clear to me that the Scala compiler has well, it doesn't cross some, so some bridges are not crossed. Yes, that's yes. true. Yes. So, so why is there this difference between Idris and Scala? So it's a design error for the Oh, Scala why team. is the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's not because of you know, type erasure or anything like this. There is Idris backend for JVM. It's actually because Idris can represent so-called p-types in dependent typing theory, meaning types dependent on terms. And this term, as in Idris' case it always is, is a algebraic data type. In Idris, any type you can create is actually algebraic data type. So without any loss of genericity, Idris can say that a structure of type can follow the structure of value because both are algebraic data types. In Scala, there, it's not like this. So in Scala, you can't really, it's a matter of representations, mostly. So in Scala, there is no, so to say, unique representation of types, which in Idris there is. So in Idris, every type has this algebraic structure, and from it, you can deduce the type, the real type of structure, uh, the real type structure of well, type. So that's the, the only difference, I think. So that's the difference of representation. What, what, what my question is more, so why wouldn't the Scala people uh, just copy this from Idris? Why? Um, well, uh, Scala is, uh, is, I would say, important language. It has, uh, you know, it's, uh, it has access to a lot of libraries, it's widely used, and Idris, unfortunately, is not. So, 
you can say that Scala people should migrate to Idris to have these properties, pro possibly, but probably they won't. Uh, so the only way to have this, in, have this without changing language, I would say, is to simulate this, and it's possible. I guess that's my answer. Thank you very much. Let's take Any one more, more question. Yep. Coming back to the uh, higher candidate polymorphism example, uh, where you had, oh, okay. yeah, uh, isn't it the case that uh, in that particular case we could actually circumvent that by by uh, carrying? So we would first fix the typo of of the function uh, and then the value, or the other way around? Uh, if you tell me which example do you mean once again, uh, the just one say stop. Make tuple. The make tuple. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Do, 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 do. I know where it is. Uh, here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oops. <laughs> Your party trick. Uh huh. Ah, it's back. All right. Okay. Can we uh, can we solve this by currying? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's my question. Because but there is nothing to cur. Ah, uh, type level currying. You mean? I mean, first take just the b. Mm -hmm. And then take the function, so it would be so the B type would be fixed, and basically we could use it in in the latter part of the signature. Mm, or I'm maybe sure. I'm wrong. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure if I understand. This. First, so you first create a function which takes just B, right? And then, and then uh, take take the function that makes the pair. So the type of the make per function is in inferred. Oh yes, that would solve it, right? But the definition, of course, there are ways to represent it in Scala. Well, you can just don't use function, for instance, but use natural transformation as in cats, and it would work as well. That's more, you know, elaborate thing, but it would work as well. But the, the thing is that definition of higher rank polymorphism is where you, where the, the rank means where the quantifiers are, universal quantifiers. So actually, the rank is the number of movements of quantifiers to the right, so to say, visually. So if you just need to move one type, one, one for all A, one level, so to say, to the right, then it's rank two, and so on, so on, so on. So uh, yes, that's, of course, that's solvable. I just wanted to show some from the definition. So the definition of higher rank polymorphism is like this, and this cannot be represented in the scala. That's it. Cool. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, yeah, I almost forgot this. Mm, OK, I will just, just say stop. No. Ah, yeah. Uh, are you aware of, of the, the meme uh, saying that, that Scala takes the lambda cube and makes it into a lambda tesseract? Uh, Scala takes the lambda cube and makes it into a lambda tesseract, so like a 4D cube. Because as uh -huh. I take it, as far as I understand it, is, is that the, the lambda cube doesn't really mm -hmm. consider subtyping. There are a lot of things that are not, that's, there are a lot of things that are not representable on Tysis lambda cube. For example, type constraints, type classes. Implicits are totally beyond this. And there are some things like, as I said, a system U which make, you know, which go even in, into more dimensions. Like system U, but that's inconsistent system which I mentioned there. And yet, yeah, what Scala does is totally out of this. In, in fact, it's totally, and, uh, it's totally, you know, beyond this cube, so to say. That's true. But if you take away all these aspects, uh, like type constraints, type classes, and implicit, what you get is basically a um, F lambda based system. So that's, uh, I would treat it more as an educational aspect of my talk, more than, you know, be all and theory. Uh, because that's true. Uh, there are some things in, that are not really well represented in theory. So just take it with a grain of salt. It's, an, it's educational more than the truth, the complete exact truth. That's true. That's Thank, true. You. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you.